take your Bibles, let's read Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. I want to read this morning from the New King James Version. Come on, let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians wasn't necessarily a church. It was a region of towns, a region of villages, a region of cities in this part of the, the, the territory. So Paul writes not just to one church, but he writes to a collective of churches in the region of Galatia. Here's what he writes, chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul says, I indeed, I, Paul, say that if you become circumcised again, Christ will profit you nothing. Christ will profit you nothing. Verse one, one more time. Stand there fast, stand fast, therefore, in the freedom in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And, somebody say and. And do not be entangled. Very interesting word there. Do not be entangled again with the teachings of bondage. The yoke of bondage. The instructions of bondage. I want to talk for the next few moments the cost of true freedom the cost of true freedom oh I wish you could hug your neighbor today but you can't but go ahead and point at somebody and say neighbor uh, 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 freedom is going to cost you something now if they don't want to talk to you or maybe you can't see them they lift moving because of the mask on just go ahead and turn to somebody else and say neighbor freedom will cost you something I want to talk about the cost of true freedom. All right, now I'm going to go back on the lapel, Mike. Thank you so very much for your help on this morning. The cost of true freedom. Please be seated. Please be seated if you can. The cost, all right, <clears throat> hallelujah, of true freedom. I, I, I know I, I might look a little picky when it comes to these mics and all, but here's the reality. And, and if you've never preached in a pulpit, you won't know this, but when you hold this mic, it makes you want to go into another gear of preaching and movement and all of that stuff. It, but, but, but when you come from a lapel, it kind of it just kind of neutralizes the, the, the presentation. And so I, I'm not trying to be diva or special, but I want to teach and I want to proclaim, not so much preach in a sensation, right? I believe messages like today will, 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 will get traction and have a distance. And I, I cannot, uh, again, thank God enough for the opportunity and the privilege of ministering on this morning, all right? Uh, I want to talk about the cost of true freedom. You know, yesterday, yesterday was not a typical 4th of July for the people of God, for, for all of us, for any of us, right? Yesterday was not a typical 4th of July uh, weekend for you and I. We're still trying to find a way to celebrate with the food and the, the fireworks and all of the fun and, and, and yet we're trying to endure this most historic and unprecedented pandemic season. A day doesn't go by where you're not comparing where you were this time last year. Where we might have been this time six months ago. Now we are now in this second wave, second stage, second surge of the continuance of COVID-19. There's yet death, disease. Unfortunately, there's destruction. And then on top of that, in this season, is another disease that we're facing. It's the disease of nasty, ugly, sinful, ungodly racism. Everywhere from white power to white silence. We're dealing with the systemic institutional, and now seemingly the overt, out of the box, and obvious racist mindsets and attitudes of many. And although we've had the peaceful protests, there's been some, I use the word some, policy reform, police reform, but there's still room for so much more change. Yet we still as a people grapple with the painful imagery. I wrote these words down painful imagery of injustices and inequalities. Every day we'd have to now grapple and think what we will tell our children, 
what we would tell our grandchildren. How do we maneuver? How do we navigate on the job, whether it's online or on campus? What will the next week, the next month, the next season look like? And yet still, this is America, the home of the free, the land of the brave. Uh, my concern today is that we still have a lot of work to do. Had some great dialogue in our home yesterday, and yesterday morning had some, some great reading and studying time, and I, I ran across a, a, a very interesting read as it related to the late Frederick Douglass. In fact, in 1776, while we celebrate, obviously, Fourth of July, President Thomas Jefferson famously penned the Declaration of Independence, proclaiming independence from British rule and the acknowledging of the sovereignty of these 13 colonies, which today we know now as the United States of America. Here's what he wrote. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We've read that and we've known that since middle school, high school. But now there's this great awakening of consciousness in reality that during about 150 of those years, there were people who were not treated as if they were created equal. There was a population of people who were not having full access to rights. And so in, in, in 1838, it was Frederick Douglass, the famous orator, abolitionist and author, who wrote these words, titled, by the way, the, 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 the speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July? What to the slave is the 4th of July? And I don't normally put these words on the screen, but I thought it'd be worthwhile from a historic point of view to look at what was written then, some 200, almost, almost 200 years ago. He writes, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than any other day in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, that is the slave, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty, your unholy license, your national greatness, your swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciations of tyrants, brass, fronted, impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and your hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all of your religious parade and solemnity, solemnity are to him more, mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. It is a thin veil to cover up the crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. You would have thought that that speech would have been spoken, received, and buried 200 years ago. Never to have been remembered. Certainly not had to been reenacted. But here we are, not quite 200, but somewhere 170, 180 years later, we're living that speech all over again. And it begs the question to ask today, what is true freedom? What is true liberty? And if there is a true freedom, perhaps there is a false freedom. What will it cost you and I to truly be free? I believe that, 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 that salvation is free, but it's going to cost you something to live it. I mean, I say the same about freedom. I believe freedom is free, but it's going to cost you something to have it. And so for the next 15 minutes, let me talk to you today about the cost of true freedom. The cost of true freedom. Again, 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now, where the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm going to give you a head start. True freedom can truly only come from the Lord, the one who makes us free. And that is not to denounce our ethnicity. That is not to belittle our plight 
or our journey. But at the end of the day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. You know, I was talking to our kids yesterday and we talked about this whole COVID-19 season, how it has crippled sports, crippled travel, crippled finances. I mean, nothing in this half of our generation have we experienced anything like this. And I can only imagine, you know, what are one of the two or three things that could rival what we've seen? And, 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 and you know, if, we, if we think we're out of the woods, by the way, look at what's happening in the state of Florida, state of Texas, right now. They say North Carolina is, is sort of on the, on the cuff. And many are predicting that if we think we've seen devastation, and I think many of us still think we're in a nightmare. I think we're, we're in this prolonged dream. And I'm not here to be Nostradamus. I'm not here to be the, the guy who brings all the bad news, but there's really only a couple of things that could be worse than COVID-19. I mean, we're talking nothing short of, of Armageddon, right? But should it not remind you and I of the rapture? That this world is not our home. Oh, we love sports. And we love travel, and we love making money, and we love tra visiting, and we love all of the festivities. I mean, I looked last night, and you look at the fireworks uptown. There was no mass, one big unified firework uptown. But you know what the blessing was? There were fireworks all over the city, all over the landscape of the city. It was almost like there was this decentralizing of one person shining, and everybody now participating. I think there are some joys and some benefits. But getting back to the target here, the truth of the matter is we are so in love with our world. We don't realize the Bible calls us pilgrims passing through. And maybe this is a nice reminder that tomorrow is not promised. Maybe this is a very subtle and maybe a very quaint reminder that we are not to be overly in love with the world systems and realize that maybe, just maybe, in our lifetime, he very well could rapture the church. And if he doesn't rapture the church for another thousand years, we better get our house in order. Because tomorrow is not promised. And so, true freedom is in Jesus. If there's a true freedom, maybe there's a false freedom. And I ask the Holy Spirit, help me understand what false freedom freedom might look like. I don't have time to take you to Revelation 3, but just write it down. Revelation chapter 3. For those that are online, just write down Revelation chapter 3. You know, you remember the seven churches in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, right to John, the revelator writes to. Well, Laodicea, they were the one church that was lukewarm. They were no good cold. They were no good hot. They become lukewarm. Therefore, they were no good to anybody. And Jesus says, you know what? I, I, I will spill you out of my mouth because there's no value to your church. You're no longer on fire, right? You're no longer hot that is used to bring the healing and the soothing to a society. But at the same time, you become so lukewarm. But here was the problem with Laodicea. They said themselves, we're rich, we've got plenty of clothes, we've got good money, we've got status, we've got power, we've got prosperity. And the rebuttal and the rebuke from the Lord was, you say you're rich, but you're really poor. You say you're, you're fully clothed with name brand clothing, but you're naked publicly. You think you've got it going on, but the reality of the matter is you have false freedom. I won't have time to go there, but uh, Galatians chapter 4. Uh, just write, write down Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Listen to what Paul writes. Again, he's talking to the churches at Galatia. Here's what he says. Now I say that there is an heir. Galatians 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, he does not differ from all of the slaves, though he's master of all. But he is under the guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. So even we, notice about the word here, freedom. When we were children, we were not free. We were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when in the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer slaves or bound, but you're now a son. And if the son, then you are an heir of God through Christ. What are you talking about here? 
Paul gives us a beautiful description of what false freedom looks like, okay? He talks about the spirit of bondage, the spirit of sin. And he says, you may be making a whole lot of money. You may be traveling all over the world. Boy, you may, not, you may be the name drop and name called and, and, and have a lot of wonderful networking abilities. And you may have the finest clothes, live in the nicest of homes, drive the nicest of cars, and have wonderful accolades hanging on your wall. But if you're yet in sin, you are bound to bondage. He says it's really not a lot of difference between a slave and a son in the same house. They kind of look the same. But the son is an heir and a slave remains bound in sin. So Paul gives this description that you be careful that you don't get back into a sin that keeps you bound. You think you're free, you're in the land of the free, you confess you're free, but if there's sin unchecked, sin in your heart, your head, your mind, you may look like the son, but you're still a slave. What makes you a son? The forgiveness, the freedom, the healing of Jesus. Uh, let me add to that. John chapter 8, verse 34. And I'm halfway finished. John 8, 34. Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, that whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Now, that, that, that's, that's a tough statement. That's a tough statement. Let's work on that one for a moment. Let's try it again. Jesus answers them and says, Most assuredly, I say unto you, Whoever commits, and this is the New King James Version, but if you go back to the King James Version, whoever committeth, E-T-H, continual, ongoing, no shame, no conviction, no conscience, no big deal, hyper grace, God understands, it's natural. I can't help myself. Whoever commits to sin, you, my friends, are slave to sin. Well, I'm a deacon in the church. Well, you're a sinning deacon. Right? I'm a praise leader in the church. Well, you are a sinning praise leader. I'm the preacher. You are a sinning preacher. Now, notice, Jesus didn't say whoever falls into sin, whoever confesses his sin, but who commits, who makes a conscious decision to stay right here in the spirit of missing the mark. You've been around long enough to know these teachings. Sin is missing the mark. More, nothing more, nothing less. When a man commits iniquity, he falls short of what God expected of him. When a woman transgresses the law, she goes over steps or over bounds, the boundaries that God has set for her. So whether you fall short or whether you step over your boundaries, if you miss the mark, the Bible says to him, it is sin. Well, if it was just a little white lie, it's still a sin. Well, there ain't no big sin, it's still a sin. And the Bible says if we confess our faults one to another and pray, we can be, we can be a heal. I, I said this years ago and I still believe it to this day. When you confess, let me, let me help you out. Let me help you. Uh, am I, can I talk this morning? Can I help you this morning? Um, listen, they told me when I was 18 years old, freshman at North Carolina a and State University, a man can talk about the things he's delivered from. And I hate to admit to you that it took years to fully appreciate and to live out that statement. Hmm. Uh, when you confess, the Bible says confess your faults, not your sins. Confess your faults one to another and pray. I believe that's James 5, right? But First John says confess your sins that you may be healed. Let me give you an example. If you want your sins to be forgiven, you confess one to another. But if you want to be healed, let me try this again. Let me try it again. If you want your sins to be forgiven, you confess to God. If you want to be healed, you confess to man. Think about it. God says he's faithful and just, 1 John 1, 9, to forgive us for all of our sins. So if you want your sins forgiven, 
Everyone's looking at me like y'all have never seen in your entire lives and preach. I have no clue what you're talking about. All right. If you want your sins forgiven, you confess to God. But if you want to be healed, you have to learn to find somebody that you can be accountable to, you can confess, and you can get ministered to. All right. That person may be a close friend. It may be somebody that don't leave the table. You don't leave the table. I don't leave the table. It could be a therapist. It could be a counselor. But I think the problem of sin in the church is we do a lot of confessing to God, and it cleans our conscience for about an hour or a week or a day. But we never walk in true healing and deliverance and freedom because there's a shame and an embarrassment that says, I can't let so-and-so know about my struggle. I can't really open up and say it's X, Y, and Z because what are they going to think of me? And that's the spirit of pride. The spirit of ego and pride and ego will always remove God from the equation. And especially, can I talk, especially in this Pentecostal spirit field, holy than thou, everybody say there ain't nobody ever seen a culture we often live in. You understand what I'm saying? We need men like never before who can get in huddles and get in circles and take time to germinate a relationship. Oh, gosh, I wish I could talk like I want to. And you know it's not going to leave that room. You need women who love each other so much. that sister, it's between me and you right here at the table. It's, you're never going to hear this again anywhere else. And because we don't trust one another, because we don't believe in one another, we often go on with unchecked sin. And we struggle. It's not that you're a heathen. It's not that you're the devil incarnated. It's just the fact that you're not in a culture creative and conducive for you to be open, transparent, and honest. And I pray that that wave has come and gone in this type of ministry. That nobody ever feels that you are so all that. You can't come to this altar and say, God, I'm sorry. And when you get finished praying on the altar, you grab your wife, grab your husband, or maybe, you know what I'm saying, I'm just trying to say, or grab another close brother in the Lord. All right? talk. Jesus said, I say unto you, whoever is committed, ongoing, making it a daily practice, no shame, no regard, you are a slave. You're not free. You don't know the true cost of freedom. He says, and a slave does not abide in the house forever. But you know what a son? A son will abide forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If the Son, Jesus, makes you free, you are free indeed. I, I won't have a lot of time to finish this message, but I do want to go back and give some treatment. Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul says, for I, uh, I say unto you that if you are, are, are practicing more of the law than of grace, if you go back to being circumcised to please men and not please God, Paul says, man, listen, Christ won't profit you nothing. Now, I need you to know this, and I'm almost finished. He's really not talking to the, just the outcast, oblivious outsider. He's talking to the church. This letter was written to the churches of Galatia. He said, man, you've done wonderfully well, but somebody, chapter 5, verse 7, has hindered you. And I've learned over the years, it's not necessarily a thing or a hit. It's usually a person that hinders your walk with God, that hinders your prayer life in God, that hinders your consecration. It's not a company. It's not a business. It's not a degree. It's not an institution. But nine out of ten times, somebody has gotten in your ear. Somebody has distracted you. Somebody has gotten up under your skin. So Paul writes chapter 5, verse 7, you run well. You were really doing good in church. You were doing good in Bible study. You were doing good in the groups. You were really, really going forward. But what happened to you? Who, Paul asked, has hindered you? Oh, the devil. The devil made me do it. No, not all the time it's the devil. Sometimes it's the devil inside of people. We don't fail to realize from time to time that every once in a while you will run into an evil, wicked person. And they have motives to see you destroyed. Motives to see you fail. They are holding their breath waiting for you to crumble, to fold like a cheap suit, my God, and die. 
but as long as you are in Christ Jesus. For the Bible says that there is no, now therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. When a man is given to sin as a slave, he does not understand your restoration. When a woman is more bound to the religious laws of the land, she does not appreciate your freedom. And here you are trying to spend all type of moments in the wee hours of the morning trying to figure out people and figure out their motives and why they treat you a certain way. The reality is how can two walk together except they agree? What common? What bond? What relationship? What unity? What agreement does Christ have with the devil? I've gotten to a point, my God, I feel like I'm talking too much right now, but I've gotten to a point now, I'm almost tired of just dealing with folk online. I mean, it, came, it comes to me, you're trying to make sense with folk who don't make no sense. You're trying to make sense with senseless people. And I know I'm sounding very, hyper, I, I know I'm sounding very hyper uh, judgmental when I say this, but when a man or woman is not saved, you can't expect them to understand the spiritual things of Scripture. The Bible says the natural mind does not understand the spiritual things, all right? And so here we are trying to grapple through certain political moments and scriptural authorities and, and spiritual things, and you're expecting sinners, and I'm not judging them saying I think they are. They themselves say, I ain't, I ain't got nothing to do with Jesus right now. But you want them to appreciate they become a mob squad and will kill anything you say because they may not know scripture. Think about it. Just think about it for a moment. We all have a pulpit and a platform for the world to engage. And we get disappointed, discouraged, because everybody doesn't understand your spiritual views. They don't understand tithing. It doesn't make a hill of being sense to them why in a season like this where people are unemployed, people are struggling with their money, there's insecurity, there's unemployment, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but here you are, you're tithing. That makes sense to them. And you're waiting for an applause. You're waiting for them to pat you on the back. They can go to the birthday parties. They can go to the bowling alley. They can go to the club. They can go hang out. But they can't come to church. But yet you can come to church. You can spend three hours at Walmart. And I was there yesterday, by the way. You can spend all this time at Lowe's or Home Depot. Right? But oh, I don't know about going to church yet. I'm a, I'm a little worried about going to church. Well, if we were in a little storefront, right, where, where that, that was a little two by five and 18 chairs in a room that only sees nine chairs, I can understand that. I'm not fussing. I'm not fussing. I'm just being logical here, being a little reasonable here. And so you want people to understand spiritual perspective with a dark mind. And it didn't work. So what do you do? You pray for them. You show love to them. You're patient. You're kind. You keep preaching the scriptures. You keep showing the love. You keep demonstrating grace. And you can only hope and pray that people will, in this season will understand the body of revival. Let me give you three things I'm going to close, all right? Three things. Uh, the cost of freedom. I want to give you three perspectives or three principles to consider as we ask ourselves, what is the price to be paid for true freedom? Number one, true freedom is having faith in the cross of Christ. True freedom is having faith, right? Not in the church, not in the government, not in the White House, not in the governor's mansion, but true freedom, my friends, is in the cross of Christ. Paul writes chapter 1, Galatians 1, 11, but I made known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it by man, but it came through a revelation. I said this last week, I'll say it again. Uh, wake up, everybody, wake up, wake up. Paul says, I was not with James, John, Peter, Matthew, Mark, Luke. I was never with the disciples in Mark, Luke, or John. You, you never read about Paul in those areas, in the upper room, or, or Via Della Rosa, or at, at Calgary's Cross. No, Paul says, I didn't join the scene until I was on the road to Damascus in northern Syria, where I was headed to see more Christians persecuted, more Christians uh, thrown in, 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 in prison. In fact, the Bible says that uh, at, at Stephen's uh, um, demise and, 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 and public stoning, Paul was in the cut holding the clothes of them who were throwing the stones. But he says, God spoke to me. He gave me a divine revelation. And you know what that revelation was? Go to chapter 2 real quick. Uh, Galatians 2.20. So for I have been crucified with Christ. 
And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That the life which now I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is Paul saying here? He's telling the churches at Galatia, if you're going to be free, right? It doesn't come because of political influences. It's not going to be because of bailouts. It will not because, become because of your own uh, 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 effort and responsibilities. It comes because you had faith and faith in the cross of Christ. You had a faith that 2,000 years ago, that there was a man named Jesus, but he wasn't an ordinary man. He wasn't just a, a rabbi. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a humanitarian, but he was born of a woman, but he came from God, right? I, I love to say it this way. He was Mary's baby, but he was still the son of God. And for 33 and a half years, unlike Muhammad, unlike Harry Krishna, unlike any self-proclaimed God or self-proclaimed prophet or self-proclaimed Christ, he was the begotten only son of God. In other words, he was Christos. He was man and God combined. He was all God and yet all man. And what makes him different from anybody else is that though he was tempted, because I think sometimes we think that Jesus lived this really insulated life and there was no temptation. Well, first of all, that'd be so opposite of scripture because the Bible says that he was tempted at all points. At all points. You don't think that, excuse me, you don't think Jesus was not tempted when the woman let her hair down and washed his feet with her hair? My wife and I were joking yesterday. Uh, uh, we were joking yesterday. Uh, uh, was it weave or was it non-weave? I, I don't believe, I don't see no weave in the Bible, so I don't think it was weave in the Bible, right? Uh, but that was a little offline conversation. We had a little fun yesterday talking about, you know, so anyway, I'm just trying to say, uh, I don't know how we are on that subject matter. But the truth of the matter, you don't think he was tempted? The Bible said he got angry, turned out the church, and turn the tables over. You don't think he was tempted when the devil came and said, hey, turn these breads into stone or uh, turn these stones into bread and uh, I'll give you the powers of the world. He was tempted at all points. But what made him exclusively only Jesus by himself was he did not sin. Paul says it is in him, Acts 17. We live, we move, and we have our being. Number two, true freedom is not being entangled with the yoke of bondage. Let's stay right there in Galatians 5. I'm almost finished. Let's stay right there in Galatians 5. It's one thing for Paul to say that your true freedom comes in Jesus, but he goes a step further and says, proactively be careful not to get, and get entangled with the past of your life. I'd like to talk about that for a moment. May I, may I speak to that for a quick moment? Number one, the, number one, the word entangled is a very interesting word implanted in Galatians chapter 5. It comes from the word which means to be too involved. To interacting. In fact, it, it, it comes from the word which means to be interwoven or interweave. What do we know about that word? It's the same word we get the word wicker or wicked from. The word wicked comes from the same uh, derivative of the word wicker. So when you see a wicker chair, what do you see? You see all these things thread and threaded together. Well, well, that was the spirit of how Paul wrote to the church and said, don't be interwoven and enter involved too much in this worldly system. I know we have men in the church who say you should be circumcised again. That was the whole argument in Acts 15. He has Timothy done because, you know, Timothy had a, a, a big future and Paul didn't want the distraction in Timothy's life. But other than that, they had this whole big shebang. They had this great big conclave. And the Bible says it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and it seemed good to the prophets and the elders. And they all concluded, you know what? They don't have to be circumcised again. And so Paul writes from that experience and says, listen, if you find yourself being back circumcised because of law and because of being bound, man, being free in Jesus ain't going to mean nothing to you. You know why? Because one thing about the law, it never satisfies. One thing about sin, it never satisfies. You're just not going to sin one time and laugh it off and think it was a nice experience. No, it's, it, it keeps growing. It's like a wildfire. It keeps growing and growing. And the Bible says hell enlarges itself every day. I wonder why. Well, because sin is never satisfied. And when, and, and when someone is given over to being entangled, right, they find themselves more involved. Nobody woke up in the morning and decided to go out and sin. It didn't happen that way. The Bible says, am I talking all right? Am I doing okay this morning? The Bible says that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Remember when Jesus came to Peter and said, Peter, the devil desires to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith not fail, right? 
What, is, what did he mean by sifting his wheat? A little agitation, a little distraction, a little diversion. I'm talking to somebody right now, right? And you can't afford to forfeit your life because of the passing pleasure of sin. And if my life is of no value to you, may I be that example? May I be the poster child? Because not everybody has a second opportunity. Not everybody is afforded. The old, oh, oh God, I can tell you the times I'd go to convocation in St. Louis and workers meetings in Memphis and some of the older saints, folk I didn't even know, they come and talk and pull us to the side, say, young man, keep hanging on. Hang in there. Hang in there. And I didn't appreciate Pastor Mary then all that that meant. But looking back, I say, God, may my life be an example to so many others that I can tell them, hang in there. Hold on. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. It's going to get better. God is faithful, and he will perform everything that he has promised. But if you don't understand that, you're given to sin. 2 Timothy 2, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul writes to Timothy and says, and the things which you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. You therefore must endure hardship uh, as a soldier of Jesus Christ. For no one engaged in warfare entangle himself with the yoke of of bondage. Here again, no one who, 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 who engages in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as soldiers. There's that word entangled again. You are not going to be able to go forward. You cannot stay straight on the road that God has for you, and you're so overly involved in things that have become a distraction or a diversion in your life. Be not entangled with the yoke. The word yoke means teaching here. The word yoke means teaching. Do not find yourself under the tutelage of somebody who's trying to make you keep the whole law. Because you can't keep the whole law. All 623 of them of the Old Testament. Be careful not to see back into tradition and to rudiments that hinder the word of God. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Tradition can be a good thing, right? Traditionalism can be a bad thing. Tradition is the living faith of those who are dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of those that are still living. And sometimes, even Jesus calls it out, I believe it's Matthew 15, he calls it out and says, it is your traditions that make the word of God of no effect. We are implanting on people things that the Bible never says. We are calling people to go through stuff that Jesus never said. So if you give yourself to the entangling of the yoke, the teaching of bondage, true freedom in Christ will profit you nothing. You know, I was at the, I'd have to close with this one. Well, I was at the food line this past Wednesday in, uh, in Mint Hill. I, mean, I, don't, I, I never go down to Mint Hill. I have no business down to Mint Hill. But we had a ministry event down there, and we had to go and I had to go to food line and get a couple of bags of ice, right? You, you were there, of course. And the Lord had been dealing with me, Brother Darrell. He had been dealing with me these last few weeks about my witnessing, about sharing the gospel. Because I, I kind of found, I'm, I'm being very, here I go with my confession, right? I, I found myself kind of getting watered down. So I started telling people, man, God bless you. Oh, God loves you. Um, you know, I'm praying for you. Oh, be encouraged. And I, 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 I started kind of reducing my witnessing to just giving something that was spiritually encouraging, right? And I think it has its place, but that's certainly not the witnessing I grew up and what Scripture talks about. So, so the Lord had dealt with me in prayer, and he summoned me to get back to the true witnessing of Jesus. Not of prayer, not of go to church, not of hanging in there, not of being encouraged. But Jesus said, if I be lifted from the earth, I'll draw all men. We sing all the songs in the church. There's power in the name of Jesus. 
I didn't say there's power in the name of prayer or power in the name of a denomination or power in the name of positive thinking. But there's something about the name of Jesus, right? So I was feeling really kind of bad about it. I said, God, I got to do better because this is not the answer right here. So I go to the food line, and, and the, guy was in the, the guy was right in front of the store who was working in food line. He was wiping down the baskets, sanitizing the little stuff and all that. And young brother could have been probably mid-20, 25, 26, long dress, look at all manly, you know, real nice. You know, I, I didn't know the guy from Adam. But, but uh, I said, man, I said, good morning. How you doing? He said, man, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you're too young to be tired. You ain't even 20-some years old. You don't know what tired is right now, right? I said, tired? Man, you know, I just read a scripture where Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. And I was going to leave it at that. That Negro asked me, what does that mean? I said, God, I thank you. God, I thank you. I sat there and said, well, you know what? I'm so glad you. See, I need you to understand Jesus really has an answer for your tiredness. I know we got through a whole lot. We got the racism and the justices and the marches and the civil unrest and then you got the COVID-19. I don't blame that. We're all tired. But I read something with Jesus. You know what that boy said? He said, thank you. He said, thank you, sir. He said, thank you, sir. So I go down into the store. I'm looking for off and sun, sunscreen for some colleagues. I don't even know what sunscreen is, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't use it, so I don't know what it is. So I asked the person, where what? Who comes around the corner but that young man? He escorts me to the off sunscreen area. I said, man, I appreciate it again. Hey, man, what I said earlier, I meant that. God has a purpose for your life. And I said, by the way, do, do you have a church home? He said, no. Nah. I said, do you know New Beginnings right up the street here? He said, yeah. He said, I live right, right, I live right up the road. I said, man, I need you to go as soon as you can. And when you get there, find the pastor. Introduce yourself to the pastor, because I know if he does all that, he'll get you know, more connected. I live it alone. I'm leaving the store. Who comes from behind me a third time? I just want to appreciate what you said to me. I've been going through a whole lot of stuff, and I don't know if I've ever heard that before in my entire life. And I said, God, who am I to predict and judge whether someone wants to hear the word or not? Right? And I'm not putting this as an indictment on anybody in the church, but we have to get back to preaching Jesus. Right? I, I know it doesn't sound, well, you know, real politically partisan correct. I know that it seems like so much of a seed sown for so big result. But something happens when the name of Jesus is mentioned. I, you, you have to believe that. You have to believe that when you introduce Jesus to a young man or a young woman or a couple or whoever it may be, that God will do the rest. All you have to do is be the mailman, be the male woman, deliver the goods, deliver the package, and let the Holy Ghost do the rest. Because that's that check. The Bible says that one sows, another waters, but God will give the increase. Come on, stand to your feet. My time is up on this morning. Come on, stand to your feet all over the house. True freedom will cost you something. True freedom will cost you something. You have to understand there's a price you have to pay to have true freedom. Now, to be, I'll be the first to admit that I did not expect to go this deep and this far on a Sunday morning. But I think it's so time out. We're trying to grapple and preach everything under the sun to keep members. Preachers and preachers and teachers are trying to figure out all of the new stuff to keep folk engaged. The Bible says when Paul went to Arabagus, and he went, to, uh, uh, he went to Athens, and he sat there and taught the tomb of the unknown God. You know what he said about the Stoics and the Picareans? He said, you know what? They always show up every day to hear something new. I wrote my Bible 2020, nothing new under the sun. Here we are all these years later, and we have a culture and a crowd of people. All they want is something new. Paul says, I'm not giving them nothing new here. I'm going to give them Jesus. And he starts with the crucifixion, the cross of Christ. And so my brothers and sisters, let me help you out just for a quick moment. Listen to me closely. Listen to me closely. You got some saved, excuse me, you have some loved ones that are yet not saved. You gotta put this thing in the next gear. Lovingly, patiently, gracefully, have a conversation about Jesus. All right, church is good. Faith is good. Prayer is great. Morals and ethics and positive and wonderful speech, great motivational stuff. But none of that will save a man. 
What will save a man or what will save your child or grandchild or your nephew or your, 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 your spouse, you have to walk by faith and give them the cross of Christ. That Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, he rose again, and he's coming back. Oh, I've heard it a thousand times. You may have heard it a thousand times, but we have a generation of young black folk who've not heard this. Don't take that for granted. Well, they don't want to hear, they don't want to. You know what, you may be right, but it's not about what they want to hear, what they don't want to hear. You have been summoned to open your mouth and share the love of Jesus. Three, true freedom is serving, honoring, and loving one another. Paul writes in Galatians 5, just listen to this, listen closely. For you, brethren, you've been called to freedom. You've been called to liberty. But do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For all of the law is fulfilled in one word. Come on, somebody say one word. Come on, everybody say one word. For all of the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What is freedom? Loving the person standing next to you. What is true liberty? Is learning to forgive, forbear, to be patient, to be merciful with the people sitting in your section. Jesus said, by all this, by all men will know. By this, I'm sorry. All men. He said, a new commandment I give unto you. By this, all men will know that you're my church, my disciples, by the love. Not by the speaking in tongues, not by the way of the hands that shout and praising, but by the way you treat one another.